Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Paula, and I'm on the staff of the Missoula Public Library, and um, kind of inherited the History Club project here for a while. <laughs> and I'm training a couple more people, so bear with us. <laughs> and Lee is going to introduce our speaker this evening. Well, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Tom Bansick. He is a freshwater ecologist at the University of Montana's Flathead Lake Biological Station that I'll just refer to as the station from now on. <clears throat> he is currently serves as the associate director, and he started at the station in 1996 as a graduate student studying river ecology. You're giving your age away there a little bit. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Um, he, he was studying the river ecology in the Middle Fork Flathead River. Tom has since conducted ecological and water quality investigations around Northwest Montana. He's led research activities on large pristine salmon rivers in the Northern British Columbia and Southeast Alaska. Tom has conducted environmental sensor networks and been active in the battle against aquatic invasive species. Tom is also an educator who gives presentations to any and every type of audience. And Tom and his family live at the base of the Swan Mountains near Big Fork, and they spend a lot of time hiking, biking, paddling, skiing, and shoveling snow, he says. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to have Tom take over. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. I'm a bit of a walker when I talk, but um, appreciate being here and uh, appreciate your interest in the biological station and our history. Um, as Lee mentioned, I've been there quite a while and I've blinked and somehow I've become part of the station history. But today I'm going to talk about Morton Elrod, our founder, who was, in my mind, a really, really interesting guy, very, very active in a variety of things. Um, I call him Montana's Renaissance man because he was involved with so many different types of things. The photo here is a picture from the cover of George Dennison's book about Elrod. So one of the things that UM President Dennison did after he retired was wrote a book about Elrod. And Elrod is surrounded by his butterfly collection. And at the time, Elrod had one of the best butterfly collections in the nation. So I don't know what drew him to butterflies, but one of the things I think about Elrod is he was so busy and productive, I don't even think he slept. He was involved with everything you can think of, and those are um, the topics I'm going to talk to you about today. All right, I'm going to start out with this Elrod quote because I find it pretty inspirational and it kind of sets the tone. It is only when one ascends the mountains that the grand panorama is unfolded and the book of nature is spread out, as it were, where an invitation is extended to all who will read. So Elrod's era, he was one of the early naturalist scientists. And during his time period, a lot of um, information about the natural world, especially in the Western North America, was, was unknown. It was being discovered by people of European descent, although obviously the indigenous people knew a lot about um, their home environment. And so Elrod wanted to foster a, you know, learning and discovery of this place that was new to him and then new to many others. So a little bit about Elrod himself. He was born in Pennsylvania in 1863. His family moved to Iowa when he was young. He got married to Emma and had one daughter, Mary, who was born in 1889. Mary Elrod Ferguson spent her entire professional career at the University of Montana, and she advanced, and she was the Dean of Women at the time of her retirement, back when there was a Dean of Women. Elrod's education was largely at Simpson College, his BA, MA, and MS, a lot of letters there. And then he became a professor at Illinois Wesleyan University, where he was a professor while he was finishing up his um, master's and PhD. During this time, he did a lot of scientific excursions to the Western states. 
He went to Montana, Idaho, Dakotas, Colorado, and he returned laden with rich treasures for museums. So this was kind of an era of discovery of the natural environment. Elrod moved to Missoula in 1897 when UM had less than 200 students and no residence halls. Uh, down here you can see the original main hall and um, not much else. He started the biology department. He was the first science teacher and he created the science education program at the university. He set up the first weather station in the state of Montana in his yard in Missoula. His home was the corner of Gerald and Fifth. And that's Mary, that's his daughter playing in the yard. And it was notable to Elrod at the time that um, without intercollegiate athletics, UM was still able to grow. But have no fear, within a few years they started football and got football going at the U. One of Elrod's contributions to Montana and the university was the creation of the first zoological museum. So back then when you did scientific discovery, you didn't um, capture things and handle live things, you shot them and stuffed them. And so Elrod had extensive collections of animals and bones and pelts and uh, taxidermied birds. And so he started the first zoological collection in the state of Montana. We still have some of that collection up at the biological station, but it became and evolved into the Philip Wright Zoological Museum here at the university. Uh, Philip Wright was a long-term professor at the biological station in the summers. Uh, we actually have a mammal plot, a gridded mammal plot at the bio station that Philip Wright set up. And um, it's the longest running mammal plot in the nation that we know of. And I don't know if you've been, the, but the Philip Wright Zoological Museum just recently got a new home in the uh, Integrated Science Building at UM. Beautiful new facility. It used to be in the Health Sciences Building and cardboard boxes, and they're doing it justice now. They've got a wonderful curator there who's doing museum and um, specimen pr uh, production education. All right. So, as I mentioned, he had his hands in a lot of different things. So, he started student government at UM when he got to UM. He started the UM newspaper, the Kaiman. So, I joke with the deans, he started the College of Journalism. He was an avid photographer back when you carried your camera on a horse, you know, big glass plates. And he taught photography at UM. So, I joke that he started the College of Visual Arts. This is where the deans stopped listening to me. The man wrote poetry. Apparently Montana only has three seasons. Which one, are, which one don't we get, right? And this is one of my favorite pieces. Vacation in Montana, 1899. Elrod was promoting nature-based tourism long before ecotourism was even a thing. So he was a visionary man well ahead of, of his times. He started the Montana Education Association. And I heard someone mention this earlier. Uh, in Kalispell, we have the Elrod Elementary School and then the Elrod Residence Hall on main campus here. So Elrod was honored by both the Flathead community and the University of Montana community. Elrod, in the early years especially, he mentored many, many students, including this young woman. Does anybody recognize this? That's Jeanette Rankin. Yep, exactly. I heard someone in the, in the crowd mention that. We all know, around here, we know who Jeanette Rankin is. Um, I gave a talk at the station, and someone came up to me afterwards, and his wife is related to Jeanette Rankin, and he's really interested in Jeanette Rankin, and they had read some of her writings, and she talked about how she was influenced greatly by her science professor when she was young, and that inspired her to do great things. So possibly Elrod played a role in shaping Ms. Rankin to become such an important figure in the U.S. history and obviously Montana's as well. 
As Elrod has been honored, so has Jeanette Rankin. There's the Rankin Hall here at the university, which is slated for a major overhaul. Um, I don't think they've started it yet. And then Kalispell's newest elementary school was named Rankin Elementary just within the last couple years. Another student that Morton Elrod mentored is Jesse Bierman. And Jesse Bierman's family homesteaded in the Lower Valley in between Summers and Kalispell in the late 1800s. And Jesse Bierman took classes from Elrod in the 1920s at the biological station. And Elrod inspired her to study biology, and she went on to become the first female medical doctor from the state of Montana. She spent her career in California predominantly. She had a private practice, but she ended up at the, in the university system teaching uh, public health. And Jesse Bierman basically created what we know today as the Well Baby Program. So back in the 1930s, the idea that healthy moms would raise healthy babies was a groundbreaking idea. And she traveled widely promoting this idea. She spent time in Latin America, she spent time in India, she spent time in Native American reservations around the West promoting this idea that healthy moms would raise healthy babies. Jessie Bierman kept in touch with the station her entire life. She had a place on Flathead Lake over near um, Mary B. Lane in between Rollins and Lakeside. And when she passed away in the 1990s, she was in her 90s, and she basically left the bulk of her estate to the biological station. And one of the ways that we've honored her is with um, the name of our research vessel. So our primary Flathead Lake research vessel is the Jesse B. It was funded in the 1980s by the National Science Foundation, and that is Dr. Bierman christening the Jesse B. in the late 1980s. And the Jesse B. today is still our primary Flathead Lake research vessel. It can handle all the conditions that Flathead Lake throws at her. In addition to, um, in addition to the boat, there's also the Bierman Professorship of Ecology. So the director of the station holds the Bierman Professorship, and we also have a Bierman um, Scholars Program, an endowment that funds education and research opportunities for students. All right, so when Elrod got to Western Montana, he explored widely. And as I mentioned, he was an avid photographer, so I've got some of his photographs from various places around Western Montana, mainly between here and the Flathead. Uh, this is McDonald Lake in the Missions. And his notes say the, the lake was formed from the snow melting and running down from the mountains. Not too groundbreaking, but look at that scenery. I think it probably looks the same today as it did in the early 1900s. In the early 1900s, he invited naturalists from around the nation to come explore Western Montana. He was very well connected, and he, um, he had the head of the New York City Botanical Gardens here in 1900-something, one of the nation's most prominent bird researchers. Silloway was working with him regularly, and so he brought people around to what he saw as a really splendid, amazing place. Hiking in the missions, pretty similar today. Hot springs, so he explored the west side of the lake that's Camas Hot Springs, still there today. Looks a little bit different. This is the site of where the Kerr Dam was built, the Salish Sanka Kalispa Dam. Pretty much right in that uh, bedrock nick point is where the dam is today. took students up into the Swan Range. This is up in uh, what's now the Jewel Basin area. But to me, I am entirely biased. Um, one of his greatest achievements was the founding of the Biological Station. And so the Biological Station, Morton Elrod, arrived in Western Montana for his position at UM in 1897. He explored widely and 
said, this place is amazing. We need to study and understand it and protect it for the future. And so within two years, he'd established the Flathead Lake Biological Station. Initially, we were up in Big Fork, and this is our current location in Yellow Bay. We've got about 80 acres and 60 buildings on this peninsula of land. If you haven't been to the biological station, I invite you to come visit. This is your biological station. Uh, in August, we'll be holding an open house. Um, we had to cancel it the last couple years for obvious reasons, but we're hoping that this summer will be normal and we'll be able to open our doors to the interested public once again. I think August 16th is our scheduled date. So the biostation mission is similar today to what it was when Elrod started it. We serve the Flathead, Montana, the nation, and the world, conducting cutting-edge research education in limnology. That's the study of inland waters, ecology, and environmental science at the lake. And we are a world-renowned freshwater research facility. We, have, we obviously work in Montana, but we've worked almost on every continent at this point in time. We have one faculty member, he regularly goes down to Antarctica, and he studies the lakes that form above and below the ice in Antarctica. He actually scuba dives through the ice in Antarctica to look at the organisms that are able to grow in such an extreme environment. I'm a scuba diver, no thank you. I have no interest in that at all. I need to get back up to the surface. All right, so when Elrod was establishing a biological station, he wanted to find a secluded place where people can study the natural world. This is actually an Elrod photo that our media person blended with a modern photo of the shoreline of Flathead Lake, Yellow Bay. And interestingly, he got seed funding from one of the Copper Kings, from William Clark. So the first 10 years of the biological station, it was basically bankrolled by, by Clark. And then Elrod did a study showing that mining has negative ecological consequences. And Clark decided not to fund him anymore. And the president of the university decided not to renew Elrod's contract until some other scientists repeated his study and discovered that mining has ecological consequences. And so Elrod was rehired after somebody else independently validated his study. The study was in the Flint Creek drainage where the Cattlemen's Association noticed that their cows were tipping over and dying. And it turned out it was from pollution from the Anaconda smelter. And it took uh, a repeat study. And science is great like that, right? If you can repeat the study and show that um, the results are valid, then you have support for that. But Elrod took some political heat for a while. Didn't bother him. And... Uh, I don't think he ever mended his relationship with William Clark, but he moved on to other funding sources later on. As I mentioned, originally the biostation was in Big Fork. Elrod rented some land and some buildings from Everett Slider, the founder of Big Fork. And that's the original biostation. And that building is still there today. It's been greatly modified and modernized, but um, I actually know the, the family that, that lives there. This old steel bridge is still there in Big Fork as well. It's actually slated for um, replacement within the next couple years, and they're going to keep the stylings the same. So this is looking up above town where the, from the power plant, um, and the river flows down into Big Fork Bay and into Flathead Lake. At that time, much of Big Fork was a slider family orchards. And if you know the Flathead at all, the Slider family still has the Slider's hardware stores, there's multiple Slider's parks, and, and Everett Slider the third, I think, is a huge UM supporter and uh, a friend of the station as well. In that building that I circled, it was the first original laboratory. So here are some of the early students discovering things about the natural world in the early 1900s. And this is them playing cards. So they were able to um, enjoy themselves a little bit in between their, their academic endeavors. This is Lasso Redhorn. He was a Pondere tribal member, and 
he really helped the station out a lot because he had a tremendous knowledge of the local area, the indigenous plants and animals, and the Flathead Lake. And he was regularly consulted by biological station scientists so that they could learn from him. Makes sense to me when you arrive someplace new to ask the local people about it. When the biostation was in Big Fork, Elrod knew that he wanted to find a permanent location. And he wanted to find a sheltered harbor near a deep part of the lake. And he brought the first gas-powered boat to Flathead Lake, and he explored the lake widely. And um, Yellow Bay is ideal for what he was looking for. We have a wonderful sheltered harbor for most wind directions, and the deep part of the lake is just a, the deepest part of the lake is just about a mile offshore, just under 400 feet. It's our long-term monitoring site. It's um, in between Wild Horse and the bio station. And I don't think Elrod knew that he found the deepest part of the lake because back then he was taking depth soundings with, you know, like a rock on a cable and he didn't have three beam side scanning sonar or anything like that, but he pretty much nailed the, the hit the nail right on the head. It wasn't. Just one of Elrod's early boats in Yellow Bay. So, as I mentioned, 1910. He got 80 acres in Yellow Bay from the federal government, from Senator Joseph Dixon for biological station purposes. Uh, in addition to the 80 acres in Yellow Bay, he also got uh, 40 acres on Big Bull Island and 40 acres on Wild Horse Island. Since then, the 40 acres from Wild Horse were traded by the state. Um, and we got 40 acres of submerged wetland in Polson Bay instead of our 40 acres on Wild Horse. We still have the 40 acres on Big Bull Island. There's a harbor there that locals call University Bay, where they like to um, recreate. And Elrod found exactly what he was looking for. A sheltered harbor, deep part of the lake. And you can see that uh, his quote there. We still have, we have photos from this promontory from a more recent era as well. Actually, there's been a big blowdown event, so it's really hard to get there now. Moved to Yellow Bay in 1910, 1912, he built the first laboratory. He got $5,000 from UM. $5,000 doesn't build you a building anymore, I can tell you that much. Uh, but these were all handmade bricks that were barged across the lake from Summers. And that's the original brick lab. And it was damaged beyond repair in an earthquake in the 1950s. I think it was like a 5.4. And the, um, there's a Mission Mountain Fault right along the east shore, and the, the mountains are rising in relation to the lake that's dropping a little bit. And one of those little rumblers uh, damaged the, the lab in the 50s, and we had to use other facilities for laboratories thereafter. But here's a picture of the inside of the old brick lab. And today we have the Elrod building. Built in 1967, former biostation director Dick Solberg got a National Science Foundation grant for about $200,000 to build a state-of-the-art laboratory for its day. Um, since then, we've built another lab, and this is our main administrative building. That's my office. I get to look out onto the lake. And when the old brick lab was torn down, a time capsule was discovered in the cornerstone. And so Elrod had, in 1912, had documented what he thought were really important scientific papers and writings. And when we remodeled, when we remodeled this building about 15 years ago, we discovered in the cornerstone of this building a time capsule that the director of, from the 60s, Dick Solberg, had put in there, complete with a undrunk bottle of scotch. So when we remodeled the building, we put our own time capsule in there. 2013, I think, we had a cornerstone event, and we put in, you know, kind of important scientific findings from the modern era between the 1960s and, and the 2000s. 
So someday when we do another Elrod remodel, they'll find stuff that I and others of my day thought were important. But here are some of the things that Elrod put in, just some, some writings. This says who was at the uh, dedication of the new laboratory. I don't remember what that one says. <laughs> but he had very elaborate script handwriting. And then he put in some scientific publications, so new species and plants. The biological reconnaissance of Flathead Lake. And this little cabin predates the biological station. We think it's from the 1880s. And since then, it has been the dining room, the kitchen, laboratory, director's office, and the caretaker's residence. But this building is still at the station today. When the new Elrod building was built, this cabin was slated for demolition. And the families that live there, in particular the vineyard family, said, not on our watch is this building going to be destroyed. And um, they took it apart and moved it to its current location where it serves as our museum. So we have a lot of Elrod's things. Actually, we have the things that Mansfield Library didn't want. But Mary Elrod Ferguson basically gifted all of Elrod's collections, writings, possessions to the University of Montana. And we ended up with uh, a number of his things. So if you do come to the station, we keep it locked. But I'm happy to let people in to look at his things. Uh, his collecting guns are in there. So this is the biological station from the 19-teens. That's the brick lab right near the lake. All right. So one of the things that Elrod did as soon as he got to the biological station was to set up summer classes. We've been running summer classes since 1899. The only time, to my knowledge, that classes have not run were doing, during World War II. The biostation was closed. And then uh, 2020, the first year of COVID, we didn't run classes at all. Last year, we ran them with many modifications. This year, we're hoping for a pretty normal session. All of our classes have wait lists. Early brochure, 1903, showing off the boat. Nineteen oh five. Oscar Craig, president of the university, Morton Elrod. And here's a brochure from 1919 telling how you could reach the biological station in the teens. Biostation may be reached via the Northern Pacific Railroad to Salish, which is what he called Ravalli at the time. Then you take a stagecoach to Polson, costs $4. And then you take a steamer across the lake, Another $4. Or if you're coming from the north, you take the Great Northern to Kalispell and then take a stagecoach to Demersville, the first uh, settlement in the Flathead, which is now gone. And then you took a steamer from kind of near Summers down to the biological station. So this is how you got here. By 1920, Elrod had brought students from 30 different states to the biological station. And I think about like some young woman from New York City who literally takes the train across the country, hops on a stagecoach and then a steamer, and then gets dropped off in Yellow Bay. It was a pretty remarkable adventure of the time. This information was not in the brochure. And Jim mentioned this, but so the East Shore Road was not constructed. And it wasn't finished until after World War II. And it was built mainly by convict labor. And actually, the, there's a Yellow Bay clubhouse just adjacent to the biological station. And that's where the convicts er, stayed. And that's where the bloodhounds were based. So the bloodhounds could chase down the escaped convicts who tried to get off the road crew. I don't think parents back east would be happy to know that there was a convict camp adjacent to the biological station. But that's how it was. This is one of the steamships arriving at the biological station and unloading passengers onto a floating dock just offshore. And this is an early photograph of some of the students, 1905. And what I like to say about this slide is our accommodations have improved. 
We now have a bunch of cabins instead of wall tents, but the dress code has not. We can barely get students to wear closed-toed shoes and long pants to go into our laboratory. They certainly aren't wearing three-piece woolen suits and petticoats and feathered hats. But we're still running our classes. The outside environment is our classroom. These students are on Wild Horse Island. Uh, we get 60 to 70 students each summer, and about only 30% of them come from the University of Montana. The rest come from around the nation and pre-COVID from around the world. Typical summer, we might have students from 20 to 25 different states and 20 to 25 different universities. So it ends up being a really wonderful kind of melting pot and mixing pot of students from different backgrounds. They can learn from each other, from their ecological homes and their socioeconomic backgrounds. We also provide a lot of scholarships. Almost half of our students receive philanthropic scholarships to attend our classes. Um, feeding students has been a really big challenge. Uh, I know it's hard to get a, people to work in restaurants, so this is kind of the, what it was like last year. Uh, we typically, in a typical year, we have four people working in our dining hall in the summer feeding our students. Last year we had two, and we almost broke them. We advertised for kitchen help for multiple months. We got one applicant who had no kitchen experience and just wanted a place to live. So we've got a different uh, caterer lined up to cook for us this summer, and we hope it goes really well. I found this one recently preparing for this talk. 1910, who wants to ride in a seaplane that was built in 1910? Not me, I will pass on that. But I'm sure you're all familiar with the housing crisis that is going on in western Montana. It's particularly bad in the Flathead as well. Floating dormitory. <laughs> that could be our solution. So this is Yellow Bay Point, and look at all these boats and uh, a, a houseboat to house the students. We might be going there sometime soon. All right. Student life at the station was vibrant when they weren't hiking into the back country to discover organisms. So July 4th was a big deal. We have the ladies marching band. The nail driving contest. Stone skipping contest. Polson still has an annual summer stone skipping contest. I don't know if it stems from this or not, but I still love skipping stones. Tug of war. Pillow fighting. This guy's all blurry because he's going down, I think. And look at the faces of the, the festival crowd here is just loving every minute of it. And this is my favorite, jousting. I've tried to bring jousting back, but risk management at the university won't let me do it. We might do it anyway and just not tell them. All right. So Elrod had a major impact on a young University of Montana that was kind of a blank slate at the time. Elrod started the biological station, which is still an amazing accomplishment. But one of the other things he did was he was Glacier Park's first naturalist. And this is Elrod taking pictures from a promontory up in the high country of Glacier with one of those big cameras with the glass plates. So. Before Glacier Park was created, Elrod did some expeditions. He strongly supported the idea of the park, and once it was established, he promoted it widely. Elrod wrote the first scientific papers that came out of Glacier. It was called Lakes of Glacier in 1912. There subsequently was a Lakes of Glacier Park number two and number three. He was the first naturalist. He was based in many Glacier. And they honored him so much that he had a private bathroom and got 100 to $150 a month. Many Glacier Hotel pretty much looks the same way as it did then. And Elrod wrote Glacier's first guidebook, Elrod's Guide to Glacier. There were two editions, one from 1924 and a second edition that came out in 1930. I joke with my park service friends that if it weren't for the biological station, they wouldn't have a lot to do. 
Some of them think that's funny. Some of them do not think that's funny. He was also working on a book about the wildflowers of Glacier Park. He never got that done. And he had a side business selling native plant seeds that he collected out of Glacier. I'm not sure if he got a permit for that back then or if you needed one, but Elrod was very industrious and had a lot of side gigs going on. One of them was related to flowers. So here's one of his photographs from near Sperry Glacier. And here's a picture from an area close to that today. And so if anyone knows the rocks of Glacier Park, this is the um, Apicuni argillite, I believe. The reds and greens of Glacier Park are ancient seafloor. They are billions of years old. And the reds are from when oxygen was in the environment, and the greens are from uh, when there was not oxygen. And this photo is taken. This is a lake that has formed after Sperry Glacier has receded. And so our director, Jim Elser, he has a project up in the high country of Glacier looking at these new lakes. And as the ice recedes, new aquatic habitat is formed, and he's looking at what creatures get there. What's the, what are the conditions like in these new lakes? Some of them don't have names, Lake X, Lake Y. One of them is called Ghost Lake because it's kind of shape, shaped like Casper. But yeah, you can see this amazing, um, the amazing rocks up there. This is Elrod up on Grinnell Glacier that was named after George Bird Grinnell, who is truly the father of Glacier National Park. And this was the last time that Grinnell got into Glacier Park and Elrod was his guide. Elrod bringing tourists up to Grinnell Glacier during that era when he was naturalist there. And some of Elrod's photos have real scientific value. So we've all heard about climate change. And um, there was a project done by the federal government, by the USGS, of repeat photography. And so they searched for early pictures from significant uh, locations that they could repeat. And so here's Grinnell Glacier. You see the person on this big rock here. The glacier is all the way up. 2008, that's the same rock. So you can see very visibly how much the glacier has receded in those 80 years. Here's another one of Grinnell Glacier. Again, a notable, notable amount of snow that is now all gone. This impresses me, so he's out collecting samples on Iceberg Lake. He had to get that canoe up there. If anyone's done that hike, I don't want to do it with a canoe on my back, but he did. Um, recently retired Glacier Superintendent Jeff Mao is someone that we work with, and he gives a lot of talks, and he was telling me, or he was giving a talk a year or so ago about how most of his work now is managing people, not resources. And they have a problem at Iceberg Lake, which is the millennials all go there to jump in the lake and get selfie pictures of themselves swimming in Iceberg Lake. And there can be a line, a 10 to 15 person line to use the outhouse just to change into your swim trunks. So the park has realized that this is a bottleneck for people who are hiking there and actually need the bathroom. They've actually built changing blinds. So these kids today can go up to Iceberg Lake, change into their swim trunks, jump in the lake, take their picture, post it on social media to prove to the world that they're living big. So this is Elrod's original selfie up in oh, Iceberg Lake. Yes, Jim. My understanding is that he was hired to test whether there was enough food to support a fish population which was not naturally there. They were going to introduce fish if there was enough food to feed them. People were hiking into the high country, but they wanted to fish into those high country lakes. The fish had no way of getting there from Flathead Lake. For, for, uh, they couldn't go up the, the waterfall. 
So he was actually finding bot bot botanical what kind of aquatic plant material or what other food material that would support some kind of fish that they were going to introduce. Yeah. So it was, he, there was a he kind of contract with either the park or the railroad service. Park, I say the railroad service because they wanted people to be there into the park and paying to get in and stay there. They wanted people to stay in those high country, country lakes too. And they did if they had fish. That's great information. Thank you. In that era, you know, managers would introduce fishes to water bodies to, you know, make it better. And Flathead Lake today has, you know, more non-native species than it does native species. So between 1890 and 1950, over 30 species of fish were introduced into Flathead Lake to see what would take. Everything you could think of, including the kitchen sink, to make it better. Now, hindsight's 2020, and fisheries managers today are trying to remove those fishes, and they aren't widely spreading non-native species around like they did in that era. But Elrod was a man of his era, and that's what society wanted, and he took those contracts. I don't personally know if there is any, if there are any fish in Iceberg Lake. Do you? There may have been some that were introduced, but whether they reproduced and stayed in any number, I don't know. Yeah, I think it'd be a pretty place, a pretty tough place to reproduce successfully. Early photo of the going to the Sun Road construction. What jumps out at me is, look at this little car. This road was not built with dually trucks and RVs in mind, that's for sure. I think we need to go to like a one-way thing in, on the Sun Road, because the traffic is so bad and the cars are so big. It was not designed for the traffic or the size of the vehicles that travel it today. And how about this? Another picture of the era, right? Hand feeding a bear at Granite Park Chalet. And look at this guy. He's so nonchalant, he's not even looking. And there's a bear right behind him. So as we know, in Yellowstone and Glacier, there was an era of bear feeding that um, is long gone. Unfortunately, in 1934, Elrod suffered a stroke at debilitated him pretty significantly, and professionally he withdrew, and then 1953 he passed away. His daughter Mary was by his side taking care of him for that entire time. The university kept him on a pension to support him, and uh, he's left a tremendous legacy behind throughout western Montana. Um, the biostation is approaching its 125th anniversary in 2024. But in 1999, we had a 100-year anniversary. And our director at the time, long-term director Jack Stanford, was the MC of the ceremonies. And our previous director, Dick Solberg, um, became Elrod for the day. And he did a wonderful job of it. And if any of you know Dick Solberg, he just makes you smile and makes you laugh. And Dick did a great Elrod during the 100-year uh, anniversary. And that's what I have for you today. What Elrod established 100 plus years ago, we continue on in that spirit, um, continuing to do ecological research, especially on Flathead Lake and the fresh waters of the Flathead watershed. This is our current director, Jim Elser. Uh, he's actually in um, Washington, D.C. this weekend, getting inducted into the National Academy of Sciences. He's only the second Montanan to get into the National Academy of Sciences, and he's the first from UM. So it's the tradition of scientific excellence continues at the biological station. And I'm happy to field any questions that you might have. Paulette. You're so busy. What happened to Mrs. Elrod? <laughs> <laughs> she had significant health issues, and she pretty much stayed in Missoula for much of it. And there were many years where he was stationed in Glacier and she did not join him. I think for many of those years early on, she was raising Mary, and, t and then Mary Elrod, the daughter, started joining Morton on a lot of these expeditions. Uh, early on, right? Yeah. And I wanted to mention that a lot of these publications are now cataloged in our Montana room area because I took our vertical files apart and started cataloging all the stuff that had been thrown in, and there's lots of the 
the documents in there. Man. Terrific. We do have it if you want to have a look. There's also a lot of Elrod's photographs online in what's called the Montana Memory Project. Amazing collection of his photos. A lot of Missoula stuff that, um, a lot of great Missoula stuff in addition to the Flathead stuff. Uh, the Mansfield Special Collections, I think they have 54 linear feet of Elrod's writings. So he was a very, very prolific author and photographer. Lee. <clears throat> I noticed in the early pictures, say the first several decades of the 20th century, you show a lot of pictures showing a lot of women in those classes. That was a little surprising to me. I uh, didn't expect to see quite as many females at the university or at, you know, at your station. Can you comment on how that came to be? We have no idea how it came to be, but we still today have about 65% female students. So it, it wasn't just a blip in time. It's been a consistent thing for decades, even today. And we don't recruit particularly any type of student. And for whatever reason, we get a lot of female students. Teachers often who were required to remain unmarried, so they had the summer off. And that actually, several of them did publish papers about some of the biology around the Yellow Bay area. So women have come a long way from that era. And that'll be the next topic we will hear. <laughs> <laughs> me too, <laughs> me too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because a lot of teachers were female said high proportion. Thanks for thanks for that, Jim. Um, during the 1960s and 1970s, we had many National Science Foundation grants for teacher trainings. And so there's a, you know, a whole generation of Montana and Idaho science teachers that came through the biological station. I love when I meet the alums who were there and they reach out to us and share their stories about their time at the biological station. Um, yes. Could you explain why the depth of the lake is lessened in, during the off-season, or off-tourist season, or during the winter months? Sure. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of... Sure. The question is, why is the lake so low in the off-season months? So, the natural formation of the lake is a combination of a the fault along the Mission Mountain front, so that there's a deep water trench along the east shore, with the deepest point being just adjacent to the biological station. Scientifically or geologically, it's called a Graben Lake, or a block drop fault lake. A Graben term means grave in um, German from the Swiss lake scientists. The lake is basically a wide spot in the river, and historically, it would be high during spring runoff, and low during the late season. We've done calculations of water in, water out of the lake, and it takes only about 2.2 years for all the water in Flathead Lake to be replaced. For a lake that size, it's a very, very short period of time. Lake Tahoe is a bit of a sister lake for us, and it takes over 700 years for all the water in Lake Tahoe to be replaced. So that high turnover time, that rapid flushing time, really helps us from a water quality perspective. You know, the waters of Glacier Park, Bob Marshall Wilderness, Mission Mountains, those are the waters that are entering Flathead Lake. And, you know, on average, each water molecule is only there for a couple years. But if you get pollution in Flathead Lake, it gets flushed downstream and isn't our problem anymore. If you're in Tahoe and you get a pollutant in there, it's effectively there forever. So Flathead Lake is a really, um, really cool water body because of that, the sheer volume of clean, cold, clear water that's coming through the system. But as I mentioned, normally it would kind of track the, the river runoff with a bit of a time lag. And so it'd be highest up near, um, you know, late May into, into June, and then would be lower in late summer. Kerr Dam was built in the 1930s. Flathead Lake already existed, but Kerr Dam influenced the, still does, the, the lake level. Today, Kerr Dam regulates Flathead Lake's level by 10 vertical feet. Before the dam, the lake would be higher than what we call full pool today and lower than what we call low pool. 
So a lot of people think that Flathead Lake has been raised by the dam. It hasn't, just the fluctuation has been dampened. During spring flood, Flathead Lake would be higher than its current highest level. The dam operators have a really complicated uh, situation because the Flathead Lake and the Flathead system is part of the whole Columbia system. And there's dams upstream, and then there's dams and water needs downstream. So there are times when we have to send flathead water down to the lower Columbia and Washington and Oregon for endangered salmon. There are times when we have to hold water back because places downstream might be flooding. So the dam operators can't just do what they want. They can't just do what's best for Flathead Lake because it's part of this whole system of you know, plumbed water from the high country of British Columbia, Montana and Idaho, all the way down to the ocean at Astoria where the Columbia River meets the ocean. Today, the dam is regulated by a 50-year federal license through FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Committee or Commission. And that requires the lake to be at certain levels at certain parts of the year. And so right now, the lake is extremely low. They've got it low to be able to absorb spring runoff when it comes, because we don't want flooding. But then the lake is required to hit full pool by June 15th and remain at full pool until Labor Day. That requirement is purely for human enjoyment and recreation, so that the bays are filled and people can use their docks and their boats. And then after Labor Day, there's a ramping period where they have to get down to a certain level by, you know, I think November 1st is one of the targets, and then uh, by February or something like that. So the lake level is regulated by this contract that was put in place in the, in the 1980s. Um, currently today, the dam is owned and run by a tribal company, Energy Keepers. Before that, it was PP&L. I think Pennsylvania Power and Light, and before that it was Montana Power. And um, the dam regulations have not changed, you know, the elevation of the lake all that much, but the timing of the elevation is pretty different than it would be naturally. And so holding the lake at full pool at that high water period during late summer and fall is actually really damaging and causes a lot of shoreline erosion. Late summer and fall is when we get our biggest windstorms and our biggest thunderstorms. And historically, naturally, the lake would be low during that time. And those big waves would be crashing along a, a significant shoreline. As it is today, keeping the lake at full pool, those big waves are eroding property away. And the erosion of the lake has been dramatic. Uh, the biostation, I think between 1990 and 2005, we lost four acres of property. The North Shore near Big Fork, um, if you know that area near the river mouth, um, since the dam was built, the North Shore of the lake has receded more than a mile. And so the Dam companies, they want to keep the lake high because water falling from a higher distance generates more electricity and generates more revenue for them. And so there's an economic incentive for them to keep the lake high so that there's more what they call head so that they can make more electricity and, and money. Since the tribes have taken over, they are still in compliance with the license but because they have no choice in the matter, but they're ramping the lake down a little bit earlier, maybe filling it a little bit later, giving up some of the potential economic revenue for the benefit of, um, of the ecology of the lake and for the shoreline homeowners as well. So when the lake is artificially high and you get all this erosion, it's bad for the lake because soils and nutrients are eroded away from the land and they enter the lake. That can cause, al cause algae blooms and deterioration of, of water quality. And um, shoreline homeowners really don't like losing their property, especially, I think, one foot of Flathead Lake shoreline is $7,000 these days. I mean, it's ridiculous the prices that people are paying for Flathead Lake shoreline property. Um, I don't know if you saw, but there's a $72 million island for sale if you're interested. Um, and so a lot of the shoreline owners have put um, seawalls and boulder riprap around the shoreline to protect their, their interests and their holdings. Unfortunately, when a wave breaks on a hard structure like concrete seawall, that wave energy is just 
either reflected back across the lake to erode somebody else's property, or sometimes you'll see a wave break at an angle along a seawall, and you'll just see it rip on down the seawall until it hits the first unprotected piece of property and then erodes their property away. And so we had a faculty member who grew up on the lake who uh, some neighbors bought the neighboring property, they put in a seawall, and he lost his entire beach and shoreline within a few summers. And so we tried during the 80s to get the federal license to lower the lake level a little bit. We had science showing that lowering the full pool lake level by nine inches would decrease erosion by 90%. And that idea went nowhere. We had a political battle. We were called out in public meetings and in the uh, newspapers. And ultimately, high political, powerful people told us to stand down on that topic. And the dam license went into effect with um, uh, 2893 as the full pool level for that June 15th to Labor Day period. So our faculty member, Dr. Mark Larang, he's retired now, but he came up with a different solution. So he's been designing and developing erosion control beaches for shoreline property owners to protect their property. And when a wave breaks on a beach with, and he designs it for the right wave size and the um, right particle size, he ranges from gravels to cobbles, when a wave breaks on a beach, it moves those particles around. It moves the gravels and cobbles around and the erosive energy is dissipated. So when a wave breaks on a beach, it no longer has the power to erode. And so at this point, he and the station have consulted or designed and built miles and miles of shoreline beaches for um, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, fish, wildlife, and parks. Um, the biggest one he built was up along the North Shore where the Fish and Wildlife Service has a waterfowl production area. And they wanted to build like three or four miles of concrete seawall to protect their property and prevent the erosion, the further erosion of the wetlands that they have there. And the station got involved and Mark convinced them to try something different. It was gonna cost them, I think, six or seven million dollars to build this giant seawall. And instead we built several miles of erosion control beach for about a million dollars. And it worked. And there's wonderful back channel habitat, back bay habitat, fish rearing habitat, the wetlands have come back and the erosion has stopped. Um, just recently in, 2020, we built an erosion control beach along Biostation property. We got a 400 foot erosion control beach that we can show as a demonstration project that one, it works, two, it's better ecologically for the lake from a water quality standpoint, but also when you put a giant concrete wall in between the land and the water, that's not a natural thing. And the organisms from the land and the water are, are disconnected by that barrier. So it helps in that way. And then aesthetically and recreationally, it's a, an improvement as well. People like beaches. And um, we had this swim area at the station where this erosion control beach is now. And there was no way to access the lake. You had to fight your way through the forest. And then you'd step off and drop off into water that was this deep. And now we have this wonderful beach where students can sit and work. We've got chairs out. And it's um, a better experience. And it's protecting the shoreline from further erosion as well. So uh, because of the dam license and keeping the lake artificially high in late summer, there's been a tremendous amount of erosion and damage that's taken place on Flathead Lake. But the upside is, you know, 1980 plus 50 years is, you know, that license is going to come up for um, renewal again and, and possibly there'll be a chance to adjust it a little bit. But the people that have docks or the people that have harbors and shallow areas, they don't want to give up any of the any of the depth because it would impact their ability to access and enjoy the lake. Question, where does the material for these beaches come from? They come from local gravel pits away from the lake. So we got for our beach, we got some of the material from a a gravel pit in Woods Bay. And then the gravels on top come from the uh, uh, the glacier gravel pit in Polson, and you know the rocks of Glacier Park are these beautiful greens and beautiful reds, and um, they are actually shipping most of their gravels to the Bay Area of California, where people are using it for aesthetic landscaping because it's that pretty. But we use local gravel that's not from the rivers and is in kind of the upland areas where the glaciers deposited them. Yes, sir. Two questions. One. Uh in the early days of the university, 
uh, Elrod seemed to be quite a driving force. Do you know if he was ever considered as president of the university, or was that something that he even considered? My understanding is he was often at odds with the president of the university, and so I think um, from what I've learned about him, he was very direct and very blunt and didn't necessarily play the political game. And so he did his thing. He knew what he wanted to do. He tried to make that happen, but um, he didn't advance administratively because he had all these things going on that he was interested in. Number two, uh, did he and Bob Marshall ever cross paths? Both of them were extensive hikers and travelers. Do you know if they ever interacted at all? That's a great question. I have no idea on that, but similar area, overlapping in time, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you, though. Jim. The ecologists have a phrase called carrying capacity. We're witnessing in Glacier Park these millions of people <coughs> are like having too many sheep on the range and they're destroying the feature. So the other thing I was going to ask though was about the biostation monitoring in some way the leaky uh, cesspools of all these homes that are around the shoreline. There's been some that have been discovered that <coughs> leaking in human nutrients <laughs> uh, into, the, into the lake and that's going to have some impact on some component of the living things in the lake. But I thought the station did have some steady monitoring map some other area of the state government. Yeah, so the Biostation's flagship program is long-term monitoring of Flathead Lake. Flathead Lake is one of the cleanest large lakes in the world. We've got an extremely low nutrient concentration, especially the nutrient phosphorus, because of the ancient geology of Glacier National Park. We measure some of the lowest values of phosphorus in waters anywhere on the planet in the Flathead watershed and in Flathead Lake in particular. We, I'll say we even though I wasn't there, but we started seeing algae blooms in Flathead Lake in the 1960s and 70s that were indicators that Flathead Lake was getting polluted with human, cause, human inputs of nutrients. And then in the 1970s, large-scale coal mining was proposed in the North Fork Flathead headwaters in southeastern British Columbia. Southeastern British Columbia is made out of coal. 40% of the world's steel-making coal comes from the East Kootenai coal fields within about a four or five hour drive of Flathead Lake. Society got together at that time and said, you know, and the biostation, you know, we think we know what's going on in Flathead Lake, but we don't have a rigorous scientific snapshot of Flathead Lake today before it gets degraded by large-scale mining and nutrient pollution from human development. People got together and fortunately determined that a healthy Flathead Lake was more valuable ecologically and economically than 20 years of coal mining in Canada, and those mines never happened. But we put the monitoring, place, monitoring program in place in 1977. We still do the same rigorous scientific protocol that we set up then. I mentioned Lake Tahoe is a sister lake. Lake Tahoe is always a few decades ahead of us in terms of development and impacts and restoration, and they set up their monitoring program in 1964. At the time, it was the best monitoring program in the world. We invited them to the station, we copied their homework, and we've been doing things the exact same way ever since. Because the mining never happened, you know, we didn't have a before mining and after mining picture, but we now have this wonderful long-term record. One of several reasons why the lake is still in great condition have to do with the, you know, all the water that's coming out of the high country, the pristine high country, the low nutrients naturally, but also phosphorus mi mitigation measures were put in place during the 1970s, 80s, and spilled over into the 90s. And so when the biostation and partners determined that phosphorus pollution could turn Flathead Lake green, uh, Everyone got together and said, we need to do something about this, and they came up with technological solutions that they invested in. One thing that they did was upgrade all the sewage treatment plants throughout the basin for low-level phosphorus removal. Uh, we actually have a demonstration plant at the biological station from the 1970s to show that low-level phosphorus removal was possible. We still have that sewage treatment plant going. It was built in 1974 with a 20-year lifespan. We're on year 40-something, and it's still going. But we are designing and planning to build a new one. But getting 
All of the communities around Flathead Lake upgraded to high-level sewage treatment plant. That helped with phosphorus pollution. Um, sewering, more of the shallow groundwater areas along the lakes and along the river corridor helped as well. So taking septic systems out of the Evergreen area or Kalispell along the river corridor, that happened. So a lot of septic systems that were in improper places or were old, they were rem removed and, and connected to the sewer system. And then there was a ban put in place for phosphorus containing detergents. So Flathead, Lake, and Missoula counties are the three counties in Montana that do not allow phosphorus-containing detergents. So those three measures were put in place, and they dramatically lowered the, the load of nutrients that were being added to Flathead Lake that were starting to turn it green. Now, Jim asked a question about the septic systems. So since we have, you know, society has addressed the large sewage treatment, um, centralized sewage treatment plants, we now have a lot of dispersed individual home septic systems spread around the landscape. And we are now starting to worry about that and focusing on that again. Uh, there were a number of studies done in the 60s and 70s showing how bad the septic systems were of the time. We would flush fluorescent dye down the toilets and it would show up in the lake. And um, the last major study looking at septic system pollution around the lake was done in 1996. The biostation worked with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes on it. And just think about how many houses have been built along our lakefront between 1996 and today. So there's an interagency stakeholder group called the Flathead Basin Commission that is now prioritizing septic system pollution as their top item of concern. We're working with county commissioners in both counties. We're working with state and federal agencies as well to try to get a handle on the septic system pollution that is entering our waters, including Flathead Lake. But there's a couple of hot spots that are problematic. Uh, the average age of a septic system in the Woods Bay area is about 50 years. Septic systems tend to last about 30 years. Uh, there are all kinds of accounts where someone buys an old cabin, don't know what's underground. They dig up an old car body or a 50-gallon drum with holes punched in it. Um, Montana has a problem in that there is no requirement to upgrade old systems. The old stuff is grandfathered in. Many, many states have a requirement when a home is sold that the old system get brought up to modern standards. So even though there's all this development, the new systems are advanced technologically and they work, but the old systems that have been in place for decades, they're starting to fail and they're starting to add to the pollution of the lake. But the biostation's involved with a number of stakeholders to try to address that challenge. And um, there seems to be uh, uh, forward progress for the first time in decades on that topic. In the back, sir. Um, I retired about 20 years ago and I had that uh, erosion problem that you've uh, mentioned. So I went to one of your open houses and, uh, and learned how from your pamphlets and that type of thing about what to do. And since then, I've hauled in probably 100 to 200 feet, cubic feet of gravel, rocks, and uh, some crushed rocks, some so it doesn't wash away, some ground rocks, and then the really teeny three gates beautiful little things you were talking about. And uh, I've had my septic tank uh, checked out. I've had it for, uh, let's see, uh, over 40 years. And uh, <clears throat> another thing you had suggested, suggested is after the, after the beach is established with all that gravel and stuff, was to uh, put in some plants like uh, juniper trees and pine trees and not water those at all. And any downhill drainage would be absorbed by those plants. Okay, does it make sense? Is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we advocate for the plants you put in, we call that a shoreline buffer, and using native vegetation and trees that have a deeper root system is much better than shallow rooted grasses. So. Thank you for doing what you did, um, both you know maintaining and inspecting your septic system. A lot of people don't know that they have septic systems, especially the newcomers that move here from cities. They just think that their waste magically goes away. So, you know, we're trying to get the word out about hey, you need to have your septic system inspected. You need to make sure it works. So, thank you for being diligent about that. Um, something I heard. Sorry. <laughs> Not a bunch. 
and good exercise. <laughs> and I, I've talked to my neighbors about their septics and uh, watering the lawn, you know, right up to the edge of the lawn and then mowing it just doesn't. Yeah. Having that bright green lawn right up to the lake is there's all kinds of nutrients entering the lake in that way. So I've showed him articles from the paper about that. And, but the worst thing I've seen is those seawalls that you mentioned. And just this winter, I went hiking down there. And underneath, it's washing away. The water is, is undermining those seawalls. What's going to happen? Uh, anyway, that's... Uh, but thanks, uh, thanks for your help and all the information I got from you. And uh, I've seen your beach there. That's cool. Yeah, I like it. Oh, good. Well... It wasn't me, but you're welcome. And um, yeah, a lot of those old seawalls are starting to get undercut by erosion. And so Dr. Lorang and others were trying to reach out to those homeowners to not replace it, but remove it entirely and add beach material to make it more natural. The thing is that uh, I think you have said or somebody has said that phosphorus is the number one pollutant of the lake and the erosion of those lawns uh, Phosphorus gets into the water through those. Um, is that from fertilizer or just natural out of the out of the ground? Or um, soils have a lot of phosphorus in them. So if you add soil into the lake from erosion, you're increasing the ability for algae to grow. But also, yeah, over fertilization uh, for those green lawns is a problem as well. What about that big fire from last year in the southeastern part of the lake shore? What's been not polluted as much as nutriently charged with forest fire soil? Yeah, when you get a shoreline fire, you lose the, the plants that are holding the soils in place and a lot of the vegetation dies, so there's a lag period between when you've lost all your vegetation and when new stuff grows to hold the soils in place. So there's a lot of concern, shoreline homeowners and the soil conservation, excuse me, districts are working with homeowners to try to prevent significant erosion during the next few years. Uh, they've also cut down a lot of hazard trees along the east shore. When the trees burn and then they tip over, that mobilizes a lot of soil that was held in, in place as well. Um, we've been looking, we haven't seen a big influx of nutrients there yet, but um, one big rainstorm this spring could do it as well. But there must be some critters that, plants or animals that benefit from some of these nutrient events. Like, when there's spikes that come and go or yeah, I know. There's always something, something benefiting from this, these accidents. Well, fire's natural, and there's a lot of birds in particular that show up in recently burned forests. Several types of um, birds feed on the insects that inhabit the, the recently killed trees. Um, there will be some additional nutrients added to that particular portion of the lake, but the reality is we've got so much water moving through that we're not going to see any lake-wide effects, but certainly some localized impacts. Um, we're just hoping there isn't going to be any landslides. Um, I've seen some roadside, some department, Montana Department of Transportation warnings of rocks falling onto the highway because the fire has um, decreased the stabilization of those banks. If you haven't driven up the East Shore, it's a pretty remarkable thing to see in that Finley Point burn area. Um, your boat that you take out every morning, is it? And uh, one of the, the, the tests you have is to lower a disc into the water, and you can still see it after 35 feet? Mm -hmm. That's about right. I was mentioning that to somebody, and they said that in Tahoe, they can see a disc at 75 feet. Yeah, but they used to see it at 90. Yeah, so Tahoe is still clearer than Flathead, but Tahoe is more degraded by flat, than Flathead. So yeah, you can still see deeper into the waters of Tahoe. It's about 60, and um, Flathead is, yeah, about 35. So the water doesn't turn over, what did you say, 700 years? Yep. Yep, just very little is entering Tahoe 
Um, we get, I mean, if you've ever been on Flathead Lake during spring runoff, it's brown, right? You get the turbidity plume coming out of the river. That's natural for Flathead. So it's just part of having a big watershed, part of having high snow melt and big spring runoff brings, naturally brings sediments into the lake and that decreases the clarity. Tahoe is a very, very small watershed compared to the size of the lake, so it's not bringing lots of material in from 150 miles away. Also in Tahoe, when they started getting their nutrient pollution and losing their water clarity, they've now sewered all of Tahoe and they pump it up and out of the basin. They drop it down into the Truckee River to flow away. So all the human waste in Tahoe doesn't go in Tahoe anymore. They've figured out a way to, to get it up and out. So that's another difference between us and them. In the back. Isn't Tahoe like 800 feet deep or something? Oh, more than 1,000. It's like 15, 1,600 feet deep. Yep. So they're deeper. They have more water than us, but we're larger in surface area. We've got a friendly competition with them as well. <laughs> well, I thought we would post the formal part of the presentation. It was an excellent one. I'm getting the hook. <laughs> I'm sure if you have uh, additional questions, you can come up and ask. And Tom, do you want to talk about the materials you left? Sure. Yeah, I've got a variety of informative materials about the biostation, the lake, um, economic benefits of the lake, flathead lake facts, uh, scary things about invasive mussels if we were to get them. And yeah, I'm happy to stay until all the last questions are done. So thank you so much for your time and attention and not walking out on me.